Good evening. You came. We're so glad to have you here. My name is Christoph Straub and I'm the Senior Manager of Adult Learning here at TIFF. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to tonight's special event in conversation with Jesse Norman. Yes, please. You have braved this nasty winter storm to be with us tonight and I can assure you that you are in for a great time. I would also like to welcome those of you who are watching online via our live stream. Um, to begin, we'd like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. On behalf of TIFF, I would like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal, Paris and Visa, and our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario and the City of Toronto. Also, a thank you to TIFF's donors and members for supporting our charitable mission to transform the way people see the world through film. Tonight's event is part of a citywide celebration honoring the five-time Grammy winner, opera superstar, humanitarian and civil rights activist, Jesse Norman, as the 12th recipient of the Glenn Gold Prize. Following tonight's conversation, Ms. Norman will return to the cinema to introduce a screening of Jesse Norman Sings Carmen, followed by, a, by Julie Tamer's Oedipus Rex. These films are part of our TIFF Cinematheque tribute, dedicated to the singer's favorite operatic adaptations and performances. On now until February 13th, tomorrow. For more information and tickets, visit our box office or tiff.net slash Jesse Norman. Now, following this event, uh, I would ask that you all please briefly stay seated so that Ms. Norman can leave the theater and then she will return uh, for the introduction to, uh, for the screening. We are also delighted to partner with the Glenn Gold Foundation for this tribute on the occasion of, of Ms. Norman's Glenn Gold Prize, which she'll be receiving in a spectacular, spectacular tribute concert and gala on February 20th at the Four Seasons Center for the Performing Arts. Here to help us begin tonight's celebrations is the executive director of the Glenn Gold Foundation. Tonight's event would not be possible without his help and we are incredibly, incredibly grateful for this partnership. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Brian Levine. Thank you, thank you Christoph. And uh, good evening friends. You made it. You braved the cold the sleet, the pellets, the slush. You're all true Canadians. Good on you, tough and indomitable. Um, thank you so much to Christoph and all of our friends at TIFF for being such amazing partners in our celebrations of Jessie Norman as she receives the 12th Glenn Gould Prize. I'd like to say a word or two about the prize. Some have described it as Canada's most internationally significant and important award for artistic accomplishment, but it's more in that it is also a tribute to artists who not only illuminate and inspire with their life body of work, but through their humanitarian efforts and their other contributions that enrich the human condition. So it has a very special mandate. And we could not possibly have had a more apt and appropriate uh, laureate than the one that our wonderful jury chaired by uh, Viggo Mortensen, who's um, nominated for an Academy Award, than uh, the laureate that they chose last year, Jesse Norman. <clears throat> Jesse Norman is a force of nature. Her career really is the stuff of legend. She grew up in the Deep South during the dark days of Jim Crow. And she rose to become a hugely important international star in the great concert halls and opera houses of the world. Um, she's worked with many of the great directors, conductors, singers, designers of the 20th century, but um, it really goes beyond that. Um, her work is, is really um, characterized by <coughs> courage, determination, perfectionism, brilliance, and of course, that incredible voice. Um, her philanthropy <clears throat> and her humanitarian commitment are legendary, and they speak to her sense of social responsibility, both as an artist and a human being. She's a true world citizen. Her artistry has been called upon to illuminate 
uh, some of the major events in recent world history off the opera stage. Presidential inaugurations, Nobel Peace Prize ceremonies, the bicentennial of the French Revolution, the first commemorative concert for the victims of 9-11 at the site of uh, the World Trade Center disaster, um, as well as uh, the causes such as the campaign to free Nelson Mandela, the fight for a cure for AIDS, for civil rights and human dignity, and finding a solution to homelessness, to name but a few. That's just the start. She's also a tireless promoter of arts education, especially through her Jesse Norman School of the Arts in Augusta, Georgia, and at the foundation, we're proud to be bringing a contingent of students from uh, the Jesse Norman School in Augusta to Toronto for several days of workshops next week with their compatriots at Sistema Toronto, and they will be at the Prize Gala concert. Um, Jesse Norman's voice, both on and off the stage, both morally and artistically, are world treasures. Um, so needless to say, she's very special. And it's not surprising that um, some of the world's great vocal artists have um, chosen to converge on Toronto next week as we present the prize to her and to perform in her honor. So I'm hoping that next Wednesday, we'll see each and every one of you. Um, there are some tickets left. Um, you should pretty much fill out the rest of the house if you all come. Uh, and it's at the Four Seasons Center with the magnificent orchestra of the Canadian Opera Company as well as our jury chair, Viggo Mortensen, who will be coming as well to take part in the presentation. Um, so uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of the wonderful um, supporters who made it possible for us to be here for this 10 days of events that we have in honor of Jesse Norman. Our presenting sponsor is Unifor, and our media sponsors are Bell Media and The Globe and Mail. And now, please welcome for this conversation about opera, cinema, and the exciting and often unexpected translation of one into the other, the uh, general director of the Canadian Opera Company and a very good friend of the Glenn Gould Foundation, Alexander Neef, and the one and only Jesse Norman. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> good evening, everybody. I have to um, make an admission before we start. Um, I feel a little bit like a kid in a candy store tonight um, <laughs> because I would never have imagined that I could sit here and talk to someone who is responsible for my love of opera and classical music when I you know, was in my teens and I <laughs> listened to Jesse Norman's voice. And if you haven't, I hope all of you have, I'm totally available after this to give you my favorite CD recommendations. Um, <laughs> And it's it's totally worth it. I can I can promise that anything you can get your hands on. So I'm so delighted to be here tonight and speak with you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Honored to see all of you coming out in this weather. <laughs> Our good Torontonians are, aren't deterred by many things. <laughs> so, if I may, I'd like to start with your early beginnings and your inspirations. Uh -huh. and um, dive right in and start at the very beginning. Um, what would you think are your earliest memories of music? My earliest memories of music, of course, would be from uh, the church, where I sang in the children's choir from about age four or five or something. And I would have thought that the first music I heard would have been in the church and then, of course, on the radio. Do you still sing that music sometimes? I do sing that music, absolutely. I had some big numbers at that time. There was one called, when I was about four years old, Jesus Wants Me for a Sunbeam. That was my really big number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it went high at the end, you see. And uh, I love singing loudly. 
And my other thing was um, Jesus Loves Me. And I understand people still sing that one. <laughs> and that was in Augusta, Georgia. That was in Augusta, Georgia. Yeah. So you sang in your church at home, mm -hmm. in your community. Yes. But where exactly and when did your love of opera begin? I think that my love of opera began really kind of almost accidentally. I was given uh, my very own radio um, at about age nine. And so I could listen to things that you know, my brothers did, weren't, weren't disturbing me while I was doing it. I could so go into my own room and listen to whatever I wanted to without being disturbed by them. And um, by that time, I was old enough to do a bit of cleaning in the house. And my responsibility on Saturday was to clean my own room, which I thought was drudgery. And so I would um, turn on the radio, and I came across the opera almost by accident. And um, I found that I really liked it. There was a gentleman who was the uh, announcer um, on the opera called Milton Cross. Do you remember Milton Cross? And Milton Cross told you everything you needed to know about the opera. He told you what they were singing about, what they looked like, what the sets looked like, how long it would last, and all the rest of it. So it didn't disturb me at all that the singers were singing in a foreign language. And it, I saw, I understood what they were saying, I knew what they looked like, I knew how tall Joan Sutherland was. And so it didn't, I wasn't told that this was something that I needed to understand more about in order to appreciate it. I simply loved the way it made me feel. And so cleaning my room lasted as long as the opera lasted. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Rheingold wasn't so good, because that was too short. <laughs> That's a very good story. <laughs> um, so from there, from the radio, um, from the opera on the radio, to um, singing lessons and... Yes, well, I did start singing lessons, thank goodness. I didn't do this as a teenager. And I tried to um, caution, particularly um, friends and other people, that have children, particularly girls, that wants to study singing, that those same muscles um, that we use for singing are there for other things in our lives. And until we've actually sort of experienced puberty, ladies, children, we should not be sort of studying singing. Allow those muscles to grow naturally. Study dance, gymnastics, whatever you want to do, but not those particular muscles. And I have found very often looking at um, sort of young, very young singers, I mean kids, you know, 12 or 13 years old, you notice that the jaw is shaking, and that's because they're putting emphasis and asking the, our chewing muscles to support their voices. Whereas if, if the diaphragm is doing the the support, then of course everything can remain for a, lo a lot of years. And so I was very lucky in that uh, my parents had me studying piano and not knowing particularly that I should not study voice at such an early age. It just happened that way and I was very lucky that I didn't have my first voice lesson until I was 17 years old. And I um, was a student at Howard University in Washington DC and was working with a voice teacher who had been teaching voice for 45 years before I arrived. And so she said to me, I know all the tricks, don't bring any of those into my studio <laughs> because we're going to teach you how to sing here. And uh, I was very lucky in that way, really. Yeah, wonderful. Um, you've spoken a lot about Marian Anderson, who yes. was the first or one of the first African-American singers to appear on the stage for the Metro Metropolitan Opera. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to talk a little bit about her, her legacy, and what you what inspired you? Yes, well, I was inspired by Marian Anderson practically before seeing her face. Um, one of the, my mentors in the neighborhood where I lived um, had some 78s, and she said, you, you're a musical child, I'm sure you're going to enjoy these. But in my house, we didn't have a machine that would play a 78. They played 33s and long self LPs. But my next door neighbor, uh, had a machine, uh, had the kind of stereo that would play a 78. And so I was invited to come over to her house any time that I wanted to. She didn't have children. I spent a lot of time there. And I listened to various things. There was Lily Pond singing, all kinds of things, and sort of singers of that era. And then I put on a recording of Marian Anderson. And she was singing the Brahms Alto Rhapsody with Munch. I thought, I, I didn't understand it, but I knew there was something important going on. 
and that I had never heard a female voice in that timbre. I never heard a female voice that could sing that low, and, and of course, incredibly beautifully. And so after that, I wanted to know more about her, and it just happened that very soon after that, there was a film called The Lady from Philadelphia. And then I was actually able to see this face and this majesty of a woman, and I was completely captivated. And I read her book, My Lord, What a Morning, which came out shortly after that, so I became a kind of Marian Anderson groupie. And I was very pleased about that because it was certainly an inspiration. And then later, can you believe, it was incredible. Imagine sort of sitting in the living room and talking to Marian Anderson. But that is what she invited me to do, and that's what I did. And on several occasions, and I feel very lucky to this day to be able to recall just being there and asking her to talk about her life, which she, she wasn't interested in doing at all. She wanted to know, by this time I was singing professionally myself, and she wanted to know where I had been and what I'd been singing, and I, that was the last thing I wanted to talk about. I wanted to know what it was like to tour Europe at the time when everything was a, a monarchy in every country, and she was singing for kings and queens and aristocracy everywhere, and invited to court and invited to, to see these people privately because they were so taken by her voice. I had the experience of going to Oslo to sing when President Carter was given the Peace Prize. And there was a woman in the audience who said that she had been about 11 years old. She was now a woman of a certain age. She was about 11 years old when Marian Anderson sang in that very hall. And she said, and I've been waiting for somebody that looks like you to come and sing in this hall again. I was very moved. So first singing lesson with 17. 17, yes. <clears throat> but by the age of 24, mm. you were already um, on the stage of the Deutsche Oper Berlin. Which uh, is absurd, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if it's absurd. Um, I, I'd say it's maybe interesting. Uh, yes, it's wonderful. Okay. I mean, Rosa Ponsal <laughs> was on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera at age 21. Yes. Um, so these things do happen. They um, do happen, I think yes. what's, what, what is really remarkable about you being on stage of the Deutsche Oper at age 24 is about what you did there. Yes. Um, which is the role of Elizabeth in um, Wagner's Tannhäuser. Yes. Um, which was my first outing as a professional singer. I mean, it wasn't as though I had other opera roles that I've been singing in other places. No, this was it. <laughs> Do you, so I'm, I'm sure you remember. How, how did this come about? Well, when I talk about absurd, I mean absurdly wonderful. I was minding my own business working on my master's degree at the University of Michigan and received an invitation to come to Washington because a wealthy industrialist by the name of J. Walter Corbett, who was from Cincinnati at the time, um, thought that he would do something in order to inhibit American singers having to, having to traipse all over Europe auditioning for opera houses, that he could afford it. So what he did was to invite 20 general directors from opera houses around Europe to come to New York on his dime for two weeks, and they had to sit there during the day and listen to American singers. And somehow I was invited to do this, and was very happy, you know, that someone's going to pay my way to Washington and I could stay in a hotel for a couple of days and all of that. And at the time that I was meant to sing, of course, it was pouring rain. And um, so I, wa I uh, arrived looking like kind of a wet poodle, you know. My hair was completely wet and I didn't have anything with which to cover it. And so I needed a, b a bit of time to sort of get ready to sing for these people, whoever they were. And I went out at my appointed time, singing with the pianist with whom I'd never worked before ever. And he played my arias that I sang. And after I finished singing, of course, like everybody, I was packing up to go. No one had said to stay. I didn't know what to do. No one had said how the, what the protocol was for the day. And so I was packing up to leave, and sort of in came this very tall sort of German gentleman, sort of speaking English to me. And he said, um, Good afternoon, my name is Egon Zeilfellner, and I am from the Opera House in Berlin. I want to talk to you. And so I said, yes, what would you like? He said, um, I've been looking through my file of facts. Does anybody remember file of facts? <laughs> I've been looking through my file of facts, and um, I like very much that you sang the second aria 
which we all know is more difficult in Tannhäuser than the first one, which if the orchestra is good, that aria, Destroyer Halle, practically sings itself. And But I was singing the prayer, which takes a, a very a deep understanding of legato, and you're singing with just the wood, the, the brass in the orchestra, so you really have to be able to support your voice. And so, boom, I was singing with piano. And he came backstage and he said, uh, that was a very good aria, and I've looked in my book and I have a date in which you can sing in my opera house in December. <laughs> this was in May. And so I said, um, and he, no, he said first, do you know the rest of that opera? I said, well, no, but I could learn it in a couple of weeks. He said, it doesn't need to be quite so fast. <laughs> and so um, I, it's incredible, I left, Michigan, and as I had this invitation, and I'm still working on my degree, I had this invitation to sing in this German opera house, I thought it would be very good to speak German. I didn't know how many people in Berlin would speak English, and I was singing, he was inviting me to sing a German role in the largest opera house in Germany. I thought perhaps it'd be better to be able to talk to people. So I went to Duke University and studied for five months, conversational German. So by the time I got to the Opera House in Berlin, at least I could talk to my colleagues, and of course I, I knew my part. I'd studied it, studied it, and studied it. And um, I didn't know at the time that you didn't have to learn everybody else's part in the opera. <laughs> I mean, this was my first one, okay? So um, I did, and I arrived and was having a wonderful time in the rehearsals. I was so naive that I didn't know that I had to, that I should have insisted on an orchestral rehearsal on the stage. We had an orchestral rehearsal, but on the mock stage. So my first experience on the stage was the night of my debut. <laughs> and the, um, the entrance for Elizabeth is a 45 degree incline from the top, from the back of the stage down to the front of the stage. And I was very lucky in that the person for whom that production had been new, Elizabeth Grumer, a wonderful singer, came to me in my dressing room long before I was meant to sing on the stage. She said, I want to give you a hint. Look at your feet until you're at the bottom of that incline. No one can tell where your eyes are. Keep your head up, but your eyes down so you can see where you're going and so that you don't sort of do anything silly with your costume. And no one else had said that to me. I was so very lucky. But it goes on that I sang the first act. Well, I sang the second act. That's when my character comes onto the opera. And directly after singing the second act, Egon Zeifelner came to my dressing room and said, this is going very well. I'd like to offer you a contract for three years to come to the opera house. And I said, but, Herr Professor, I haven't finished the opera. <laughs> And his retort was, but I heard you sing that in New York. That's fine. <laughs> um, talk about absurdity. Wonderful absurdity. Yes. <clears throat> and then, I mean, it kind of continues in a very unusual fashion because yes. you decided not to stay. After three years, after being invited to sing so many operas that I knew my 20s voice was not ready to do, like um, Parsifal or Chrysotomus and Electra and those things. Um, it was becoming increasingly difficult as a very young singer to keep saying, oh, I don't think I ought to. And so I, um, in my naivete, went along to this wonderful man that invited me to come to this opera house. And I said, I think I need to go away for a few years and have a bit more experience simply singing, and then I can come back and do things like Kundry and so on, but not right now. I don't really think that I should. And I thought he would say, oh, what a clever girl. <laughs> and he said something in German to the effect, uh, who in the world do you think you are? <laughs> and uh, it wasn't quite that unkind, but it was, you know, you um, must be touched in the head or something. And um, I did go, I left the Opera House not knowing what I was going to do next. I mean, it isn't as though I had sort of reams and reams of things on my list of um, sort of touring. I was, of course, always a recitalist and always enjoyed that, but I didn't have any big plans. I just thought that in order to save my voice that I had to leave the Opera House at age 26 because I wasn't going to sing Kundry at age 26. Better not. Better not, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. 
Yes. Because it's not only the singing. Right, it's it's the, not only the singing. It's the emotional involvement. It's the emotional involvement and the rehearsals and the fact that you're singing. Of course, in Bayreuth, and this is where these operas were written to be performed, the orchestra is under the, under the stage. I mean, so they're not uh, overpowering the singers at any point. And the, the hall, of course, in Bayreuth is wood and the seats are uncomfortable because they're wood too. But, of course, the sound, of course, is glorious. And so you're not worried about the fact that the orchestra could be too loud for you. And um, that is not the case in other opera houses because the orchestras are in the pit. Indeed. So let's go back to performing opera just for a second and, and yes. about the emotional part of it. How, how did you deal when you were still performing opera with the emotional toll that singing certain parts take on you? Well, you know, when I think about that, I, I think I learned something very important early in my performance life, I had the great privilege of working in London in the last days that Sir Laurence Olivier was working on the stage. And he was doing King Lear, and you could imagine. And of course, th the world was there to see him do this. And uh, it was filmed, and he was speaking, of course, on television about doing Lear for the last times and all the rest of it. And one of the people interviewing him said, what, how do you manage to do King Lear eight times a week? And he said, Larry walks into the stage, into the, into the theater. King Lear walks onto the stage. King Lear walks off to the stage, and then Larry goes home. And I thought, now that is an interesting way to look at it, that all of the drama that you have to offer in these roles has to be on the stage at the time. And after that, you simply have to let it go. Because you've got to do it again tomorrow or in the opera in two or three days. And so that has to be something that one has to learn very carefully. I remember very well singing Erwartung of, of Schoenberg. And the person that was meant to cover me was ill, and so I was going to have to do all 12 performances. I thought, oh, this is going to be good. And so after those performances, I was simply, I, would, I lived about two, uh, an hour and 10 minutes from the stage, from, from New York City in Westchester County. And I would use that time to simply calm down from the opera, and I wouldn't talk about it anymore. I wouldn't speak about it in the car. I didn't go out with friends out of the opera. I knew that I needed to come down from being that crazy person in Erwartung and get ready to do it again in three days. And I was very happy to have just heard that bit of information from that fantastic actor to know that the drama has to be on the stage, otherwise you, it's, it's too much. You mustn't take it home with you. Very good. You were um, always known for your mastery um, of interpreting not only the music, but also the text. Yeah, Do you I'm want very, to talk yes. a little bit about the importance of text It is singing? extremely important. I think that, first of all, I don't sing in a language that I don't speak. <laughs> I was working with a bunch of uh, students about, um, well, about four or five years ago, and I, one of the students really made me laugh, and I still laugh about it. Uh, she said, I was talking to her about the text, and she said, yes, I understand you're a text-based singer. <laughs> and so I said, excuse me? And so I said, um, could you tell me what the other kinds of singer is? Since I'm not a flautist or a violinist, and we have words, um, what should be the other basis of our work here? And uh, bless her heart, she didn't know what she was talking about. And um, <laughs> It is extremely important to me, for myself, or working with, with um, students, as I will have the privilege of doing here at the University of Toronto, that you need to understand what you're singing in order to be able to sing it. Otherwise, it won't make sense for you. There are so many ways of interpreting a text if you know what it means. I mean, something as simple as, in German, the words, I love you. Ich liebe dich. You can say, ich liebe dich, ich liebe dich, or ich liebe dich. That's three different words of saying, you know, three different, three different ways of saying three different words. 
And if you don't know what part of the sentence is the verb and which part is the adverb and which part is the, the subject, how can you possibly sing a love song? You don't, if you don't know exactly what it is you're singing, how can you wish for death on the stage when you don't know what it is you're talking about? And I have found it very interesting to work with, um, for instance, conductors <laughs> who um, conduct music and they don't actually understand the text. I don't know how they get away with that. I was working with a, a person and I was singing The Death of Cleopatra, which is a great drama scene by uh, Berlioz. It's not from an opera. And it's um, something that he wrote for the Prix de Rome for which he didn't get the prize, isn't that crazy? And, um, and this is very dramatic and Cleopatra, of course, you know, sort of dies at the end and all the rest of it. And the um, conductor said to me at dinner afterwards, now we had rehearsals and the performance had gone relatively well. And he actually said to me, how does Cleopatra die? <laughs> I said, um, <clears throat> <laughs> in third grade, um, we talk about an asp, and then the teacher had to explain what an asp was. So we just used snake and just was done with it. And um, that whole last seven minutes of the death of Cleopatra is about the asp and dying. How could he have inducted it and not known that? So you certainly couldn't sing it without knowing that, couldn't you? <laughs> it is, it's absurd, it's yeah. crazy, yeah. it's ridiculous. Okay, how do I get, up, get myself out of this <laughs> hole? Um, <laughs> <laughs> back to the script. Okay. Um, so you obviously had a big career in opera and in recital um, mm -hmm. with orchestra and with piano, but you've also done so many other things. Um, you've kept a very, very broad um, curiosity probably yes. throughout your career with you know jazz and spirituals and going even as far as performing with Sting and Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. Um, how do you, f I would be very happy to talk to you, uh, to us about you know all of these collaborations, mm -hmm. but I'd be especially interested to know what it taught you for your own practice in classical music. What classical music has taught me? No, what Working with non-classical oh, artists working with has non taught oh, you Oh, well, for yes. Now, that is an interesting question. Because the first time I did something that was um, outside of what I would, was doing normally was a, an album, um, oh gosh, all the times passed, with Michel Legrand. And it was my first activity, really personally, with jazz musicians. And, of course, if you're recording, I don't know, Don Giovanni or Figaro or whatever else, you walk into the studio and all the singers are so con concentrated on what they're doing. People hardly talk to one another. Everybody's sort of drinking tea and getting ready to sort of do whatever it is one has to do with that particular session. I walked in with the jazz musicians. They said, how are you doing? <laughs> and Grady Tate was doing the drums. He said, listen to this. Do you want more feathers or you want me to use more top hat? I mean, this was the kind of thing that we did before sort of recording you know, one of the songs. And I said, this is very different from recording, you know, the Wagner arias. And I, I loved it. And I was very relaxed myself and had had the privilege of working on the songs with Michel Legrand beforehand. But it was really interesting to see a different, completely, completely, completely different approach to recording, which was my first experience. And of course, Ron Carter, who was playing the bass, had, I think by then he'd done about 900 recordings or something. So he was really just wanting to know, what do you need? You want me to sort of move? Do you want the bass to walk? Do you want me to sort of give you chords? What do you want me to do? And it was just fantastic because it seemed as though we would be improvising. And that was, that was a bit new as well. And it was wonderful. Wonderful. And, you know, you've by now had a very long career yes. in singing. How do you retain a sense of curiosity towards the new and um, what how do you let yourself be guided to the discovery of new repertoire and when you found it how do you prepare for new things that you do well I, I try to keep up with what is going on and I have sort of had conversations with people that do rap or hip-hop 
just trying to figure out what is all that about and how it sort of is meant to affect music and society and art itself. And I do feel, talking about such artists, such performers, that some of them are really, that really have something to say and uh, others are doing a lot of marketing and, and that works for them as well. But as far as an artistic contribution, I find that can be a little bit missing for me. But I do try to, to understand what is going on and to follow this. I love dance. I love modern dance. I love, of course, classical ballet. Um, but I do just try to, to know what is happening and to, in my own way, participate in that as much as I can. And that keeps things interesting and new. And I uh, tried to find out who's the latest jazz singer, who's the latest jazz pianist. I mean, there are so many these days. It's just amazing. I hope they're all working. I mean, there are just so many people. It's just fantastic. But I try to to just sort of keep up, I say. Yeah. Wonderful. So um, we have two wonderful, memorable clips from your career now for all of us to watch. Um, the first one um, from your acclaimed recording of Carmen with um, Seiji Ozawa conducting. Uh -huh. um, and if you have a free evening after this, uh, the, doc the full documentary will be screened at 8.30. So do come back um, right here in this very same cinema. And then directly after the Carmen clip, we're going to see one of the earliest recorded um, ones of your Met broadcasts from the Valkyrie, with you um, singing an excerpt from Act Three, Sieglindes O Herstes Wunder. Ah. So let's let's just um, s watch those two, and then we can talk about okay. them. Okay. <laughs> two very different sides of you. Two very <laughs> different sides. Yes. Thank so you. So, Carmen from 1988. Mm -hmm. um, and you were a little bit more like on the German track, I think, yes. you know, with like some of the Wagner parts and Ariadne and all these things. Yes. Um, and then you decided to record Carmen, Carmen and, yes. and break away from this rep repertoire. Mm -hmm. And not only did you record Carmen, you also recorded it in a very special way. Mm -hmm. And we've heard the Habanera and you chose a very unusual tempo. Yes, um, for for the aria and mm -hmm. probably it's the slowest tabanera ever <laughs> recorded with the same with the least breath taken yes. at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, <laughs> which is always something that I cannot get over when I listen to recordings. It's when is she <laughs> taking you. a breath? <laughs> <laughs> so you you want to talk a little bit about the decision to record Carmen? Well, I was asked to consider it, and I thought maybe not, and then I. Um, called Seiji back again. I said, you know, I thought about this and I really do want to do it. And I think he's still laughing about this after all those years. I said to him at the time, all of the characters that I sing die and go to heaven. They're either nuns to begin with or they're nuns in the middle of the opera or they're nuns at the end. <laughs> It'll be wonderful to sing a character who doesn't know where heaven is. <laughs> and doesn't care. <laughs> And he said, this is the way you think? I said, yes, I do think that she doesn't care about heaven. And it'll be interesting to be sort of um, able to, when you think about sort of the Me Too era that we have right now, uh, it's very interesting, uh, Carmen is a character, isn't it? She acts like a man. <laughs> and that she's really rather, well, you know the the opera very well, and she um, doesn't meet a very good end, but she has a lot of time on the way there, boy. <laughs> and a lot of fun. And so opposed to that, what does the role of Sieglinde mean to you? Ah, oh, Sieglinde. I love that role. I've always, I think, um, that when Sieglinde grows up, she's going to be Isolde. And I love this character, and the joke that I tell about Siglinda is that were it not for Siglinda going off in the forest and having this baby by herself, there would be no more opera. You wouldn't have Siegfried or Goethe Dammerung. She gives birth to Siegfried, thank goodness, and so the opera can go on. So you have four instead of two. But it is, uh, seriously, it is a beautiful part. 
And I love it because she's so vulnerable at the end, at the beginning, so unhappy. Who wouldn't be unhappy married to Hunding? But at the end, when she leaves, and that is the last, her last um, song on the stage at the time, she's so happy. She knows that it's her responsibility to make sure that the sword goes on living. And it really, I, it's one of my very favorite ones, even though I've been very lucky to sing a lot of it. But I, I love this character particularly. Well, and it accompanied you, accompanied you through your career. Yes, it really has. It's really and has. And you recorded it twice. Yes, I recorded it twice, yeah. and I've sung it on stage as a part of an orchestral concert, the first act, um, with so many different tenors. I mean, it's amazing. Yes, it's really incredible. Wonderful. So let's go from film to opera to movies. Yes. Um, and one of the movies that TIFF is screening this week as part of the tribute, tribute to you is Diva, a um, mm -hmm. movie from 1981, the story of a Paris telegraph boy who becomes so bewitched by an opera singer that he steals a recording of her voice and her dress and unleashes a series of thrilling events. Um, so I'm told this is actually based on real events. Mm -hmm. And on a personal note, I went to um, university in Germany and in Tübingen, and there was a movie theater there that every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock would screen Diva. <laughs> and there was a oh, th th there was a devoted following yes. of people who would gather um, <laughs> on Sunday morning to watch Diva. So, <laughs> oh, that's very funny. Well, Jacques Prévenix, he did uh, tell me about his plans for the film at the time that he was doing it, and he wanted to to know if there really had been someone that had stolen the dress. And so I said they stole that he stole a part that someone stole a part of a dress. It wasn't at least the whole thing. But our fans can be enormously devoted sometimes and get a little bit carried away with um, sort of their devotion. And uh, it has happened on several occasions when people have simply helped themselves to, to things that belong to me, which I have found to be rather odd. You know, from the, from the dressing room, you know, while you're sort of getting ready to go home or change your costume or something, you go out and see that your scarf is gone. And where is it? Is it on the floor? Is it still in the bag? What's going on? And um, it's, it's very strange. But I, I loved the opera. Have you seen Diva? Yes. It is really, I think it's really very well done. Yeah, it is a good movie. I mean, all of this kind of confirms your unusual path <laughs> that, that you've <laughs> well. taken all the time. And, and also your sense of curiosity to kind of get off the beaten mm -hmm. um, track and your open-mindedness for experimentation, um, unusual repertoire. Um, and that has led you to collaborations with, you know, people like Steve McQueen and mm -hmm. Robert Wilson. When you collaborate, what are the qualities you seek in a in a director, be it an opera director, or a movie director, or a theater director? Well, the very, very good ones come to the first rehearsal with an open mind about what the, the singer is able to do physically or vocally. And I think that that for me, is a, is a quality that I look for in a director. It it's, can be rather more difficult to work the, with a director who comes in with a plan saying, this is where it's going to be, this is how you're going to feel, and this is where it all works, and this is what you feel about this character, and this is what you were thinking at that time. And I think for a person that is untried and inexperienced, that kind of thing might work very well. But once you've had a bit of experience and have come to understand yourself perhaps a bit better, um, it is simply more fun and more interesting artistically to work with a director who's able to have a conversation with you. And when that doesn't happen, I think, it's, I think it shows, I think it certainly showed with me on those occasions when I've been working with a conductor, with a director who simply didn't allow for any blossoming from you because everything was written down and, and rehearsed beforehand, before you arrived, which isn't, I just don't feel that it allows for the art itself to breathe. Which leads us right into our second um, clip, 
really. Um, one of your most wonderful roles um, was your casta in Serinsky's Oedipus Rex. Yeah. And the clip that you're, that we are just about to see, um, was filmed in Japan at the Matsumoto Festival. Um, and the production was by none other than the theater director, Julie Taymor. So let's just watch it and then okay. again we will talk about it. <laughs> wow. So this is really one of the most stunning filmed versions of any opera production I know. Um, and very surprisingly, this was actually the first time that um, you worked with Julie Taymor, but yes. it also was her first time um, to collaborate with opera singers. Yes. And she was able to convince you to do something very daring and special in this production. Yes. Would you like to talk about that? Well, there were very, there were many sort of daring things. I mean, look at the costume. The first time um, we talked, she said, um, the costume that I'm thinking about, I want to cover your hands. And so I said, but Julie, I can't sing without my hands. And so she said, but you'll still be able to use them, but you know, they will be covered. And I thought about it for a while, uh, over a couple of two days. And so I said, well, I'll try it, but I'm just not sure it's going to work because I use my hands so much. But of course, working with her, I understood exactly what she wanted and was pleased to, pleased as anything, to, to work with her and, and to do this. And another thing that we did that was very daring for me is that when Jocasta, of course, I'll tell you another story. When Jocasta is dying, that she asked me to fall as I did, as you see on the film, onto a disc. And the disc was going to rise up four stories oh. into the top of the theater. And I said, now, Julie, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Does it have to be like that? <laughs> and she said, it's absolutely secure and do not worry about it. And so then I, um, being a bit of a skeptic, um, invited about four of the stagehands to go onto the disc. I said, let me just see how this works. <laughs> so you four lie down on the disc and I'll watch it go up and sort of see how that sort of looks. And I was convinced to do it, but I did close my eyes the entire time to make sure that I didn't um, sort of feel sort of woozy or anything about it, but I did enjoy it terribly. I have to say about this opera, um, it was, uh, I think, about the second opera that I did at the, at the Met, and I had done Cassandra, Who Dies, and I'd done Dido, Who Dies, and now my young nephews were coming to see Jocasta, who doesn't have a happy ending either. And my nephews, of course, are very grown up now and sort of doing incredible things, but they were quite young at the time, and Joseph, who will be with us on the 20th, he'll be, you'll meet him. Uh, he's wonderful. He's a practicing physician at the, at the time now. But at the time, he was quite young. And he came to me and he tugged at my costume and the Jocasta costume in the, in the Met um, sort of dressing room. He said, Anche, are there any operas where you sing where you live happily ever after? <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, Let's, we'll find one, absolutely. <laughs> Although there probably weren't all that many. There weren't that many, no. I've only recorded one opera where there are well, any laughs. <laughs> or as I say, in, in any good opera, somebody has to die at the end. Somebody has to die at the end, somebody yeah. has to be. And then, of course, it's a trope that always has to be the woman, mostly. Uh, is that <laughs> funny how it yeah. always is a woman? Yeah. We must look into that, well, it is. Absolutely. <laughs> you die more beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> the music is certainly wonderful. I mean, uh, well, there's always music beautiful to die by. So this was a filmed performance. This was a film performance. I was singing live. I wasn't miming, absolutely. Yeah. What do you think are the challenges of kind of translating a film performance on a screen? I think, again, you have to be fortunate enough to work with a, real, a really good director. Because the director has to work with the director of photography to talk about what, what the shots would look like and long shots, close-ups, and all the rest of it that one can do in film that, of course, one can't do on the stage. And I think it has to be someone who really understands cinema, who understands film, 
as well as working on the stage. They're not, certainly in my experience, I've not had um, the opportunity to work with a lot of people who've had those both, both of those experiences. But I really do feel that it's necessary in order to, to have the opera to look alive on, on the stage. I mean, it's so wonderful when you can work with someone who understands that the way the thing looks is extremely important, but the way it sounds is also extremely important, and that the two things have to go together. Yeah, absolutely. This leads us beautifully into our last set of cliffs, okay. and really from film performance into opera movies. Yes. And you've chosen two, one of the two of the best, really. Um, we're going to see a short excerpt from Ingvar Bergman's. Um, version magic of the flute. magic flute yes. in Swedish. In um, Swedish, yeah. And then another um, excerpt from what happens to be one of my favorite opera movies, um, Joseph Lucy's Don Giovanni. Yes. So let's look at those two, please. Well, first of all, the Bergman was not a stage production. It wasn't filmed in an opera house. It wasn't conceived as a stage production. It was conceived as a film. And so you can see the elements of working with a tremendous stage director with a passion for film. And the, re the track was recorded ahead of time, so the singer's actually sort of singing synchronized. And he was insistent upon sort of using singers to sort of look like their parts. And of course, and that is one of the reasons I think that the film is so, so beautiful. But I also just like the, the idea that he understood movement and he understood so well how to sort of use a camera on faces and the whole idea of the, and you, you have to see the whole film, the, the way the, the magic flute sort of looks in this thing, it looks to me like you're looking through a beautiful impressionistic gauze and sort of seeing a film through that and it is it is simply wonderful. This came out in sort of the mid seventies, did it not? And it was certainly, 75. it was seventy-five. Seventy-five, okay. But it was, it was such a revelation as to how film could look on, on how an opera could look on film, that I think it changed the way a lot of directors started to work on stage. I really do feel there was a lot of in influence there. And of course, the Lozé film, the Don Giovanni, was the first opera film that was filmed on location. I mean, this was filmed at the Palad Palad Palladio in Vincenza, Italy. And so all of it was filmed sort of the way you would make a feature film instead of the way one would do an opera. And of course, Lozé was incredible. I mean, the, the films that he made. Um, and his approach to doing this was completely cinematic. And I think extremely successful, and it is wonderful. You must see that. You must see that production all the way through because it is amazing. Just the way it begins. Apparently, the Palladios in, in sort of this period of time all had uh, sort of factories or something we would call a factory, sort of attached to it where workers actually sort of earned a living, and a lot of them had glass houses. And so he uses the glass house in the beginning of the film, of the this particular Palladio. And it is amazing to see that you don't quite, when you see it at first, you don't quite know, quite understand what's going on. Oh, how does it look like this until you realize it's inside of a building. He also uses that at the end of the film. And it is, it is something extraordinary. And it was so amazing to see an opera that was absolutely the, the best cinematography you could imagine. It was really, it's really quite fantastic. And you know, but also both films really use professional opera singers as actors. Professional opera singers, exactly, not sort of actors that are miming to the music. They're actually singers, which is of course extraordinary. Yeah. And that cast from Losey's film, my goodness. Yeah. And do you think that's set a different bar than for acting on the operatic stage? I think so. I think the directors, perhaps because of Bergman and perhaps um, a few other people as well as Losey, understood that. Opera singers could actually be taught to move and to express in ways that were perhaps not done previously. And I think that uh, sometimes, in my opinion, it goes a little bit too far, but um, I think that it is <laughs> important that we can walk around and sing at the same time. Well, I, I want to say, where do we go after you being four stories up 
about yes, the stage. Exactly. Really? Like, I stayed with my eyes closed until I came down again, I promise you. <laughs> um, I want to take a step further in this conversation now. Talk a little bit about the future of opera. Yes. Your, 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 your causes, your activism. Mm -hmm. And so in, in 2003, you started the Jesse Norman School for the Arts mm -hmm. in your hometown of Augusta. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us about the school, what motivated you to start it? Well, I was um, contacted by some friends of mine in Augusta, uh, where I was born. And uh, they were part of a foundation, especially for children. And they said they wanted to do something that had to do with the arts and children. I said, well, then we need a school. And so we decided, started planning this whole school and would decide how it would work as we went along. That would be tuition free, that children would have to um, audition, that we would not only have music, we would have all of the arts that we could afford at the time. And it has grown into something that makes my heart beat too fast just to think about it because we are now in our 14th academic year. And the, and the children really are golden. 15 of them will have the privilege of coming to Toronto this week. And this is for, for most of them, this will be the first time they had traveled outside the country, you can imagine. And to come to be a part of working with other children, the Setima children here, who are the same age. And uh, we decided what age group we would work with. My mother had been a teacher and she always said that if you get the juniors to understand in that period of time in their development, their own worth, and this is children between 11 and 15, which we used to call juniors, I think we now call them middle school. And um, she always said that if you could get them to understand their own worth in that period of time, they would be saved as, as human beings, as people. They would develop in a good and, and productive way. Whereas if you don't instill that kind of understanding of self and that understanding of your own place in the world in a positive fashion, that this is something you go on fixing for the rest of your life. And so we are very proud at this school. Our mission is to develop full people, to develop kids that will grow up to be full, important, and supportive citizens of where their communities where they live. We would love for them to be in the arts if they choose that as a profession, but that isn't the aim of the school. The aim of the photography classes and the dance classes and the individual instrumental classes and the choruses and the productions that they do at the end of um, each term, this is to teach them to work together with other people and to understand what they're able to contribute. I mean, they did, for instance, a production of The Wiz um, about four years ago, where not only did they build the sets, they built the costumes, and they did the, the music. I mean, it is simply a wonderful way for children to grow up and to grow into themselves and to understand that they, they have a place in this world and that they have a voice and that this can be expressed in a positive way. That building full people resonates a lot with me. Yes. And I think we need more of that today. We really do. Um, it reminds me of something that my mentor, Gérard Mottier, used to say. Oh. He always said, there can't be democracy without the theater. You can't, exactly. And the, we talk about a great deal, certainly in, in the United States, we talk about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And we call this STEM. And I'm so happy to see that there are one or two politicians that have voices and the speaking out that has to be called STEAM because it has to include the arts. Yeah. And that we should stop worrying about people in other countries that we think are sort of running ahead of us in mathematics and engineering and, and technology and so on. We don't understand that you can hardly walk down a street in India where somebody isn't dyeing something that they're going to sell to you as a beautiful scarf or carving something that they're going to sell to you and show to you they could do this with just a knife and a piece of wood. That the arts are so a part of some countries and some communities that it isn't even called art, it's just called life. It's just called living. And if we could only understand that in our part of the world, we would be, I think, so much better off, and I think the whole world would be so much better off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
this would have been a great last word shift to this conversation, but I do have <laughs> two more questions on here that I would like to get through. So um, let's just, we'll just have to try and keep it on this level. Okay. Um, you you obviously came of age um, in a segregated country. Yes. Um, and you've gone on to fight, you know, prejudice and discrimination throughout your career. Yes. Um, joined the civil rights movement. You performed at Nelson Mandela's the Nelson Mandela Freedom Festival. Um, Clearly, that's another cause that's very close to your heart. And yes. What kind of legacy would you hope that you can leave or inspire to the next generation? My legacy? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, We're getting to the big questions we're now. We're getting to the big questions. I hope that I would inspire people artists, musicians, whatever, to go, to step beyond ourselves, to step beyond our professions, and to make sure that we are a part of the communities in which we live, and that we are supportive of people that need support. And that we understand that that is a, a duty, that's the, somebody said, that's the um, price you pay for being a human being. That you're concerned about the welfare of other people and that this should be something that is a part of your own thinking and not something that you, you'll do when you get around to it or that you'll think about it when you've got time. That we have, certainly in the United States, there are so many people that are homeless and uh, are in need of all kinds of social support that certain parts of the government feel are not necessary and those of us that have a voice have to speak out against this close-fisted attitude towards people that need help. And I think that it, if I had any legacy at all, I would like to say that I cared and that it showed. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You did answer my final question with your previous answer, so that, okay. that was beautiful. <laughs> um, I think we have a little bit more time to open up the floor for audience questions. And we, I think there are a couple of volunteers in the room with microphones. So if you have a question and you want to make yourself known, we will get a microphone to you. I think this is person just behind you first. Listen, we can't hear wonderful. you. Sorry. It's wonderful to see the depth of your person. Can you hear me now? And my question is, oh, how did you know when you were very young that you could not take certain roles because you're, when you were in your 20s, that, yes. you, that your voice would, be, would suffer from that? Yes. Well, um, Phyllis, I was a part of the Opera House and I went to a performance practically every night. I was so new in this, I wanted to learn all about it. And at the time that I started at the Opera House in Berlin, they had 80 operas in the repertoire in one year. That's a lot of operas. And I went to a great number of them and found that there were a lot of singers that were only slightly older than I, whose voices sounded about 50 years older than they were. And I didn't understand what was going on until I realized that they would sing one opera on Monday night, another opera on Tuesday night, and something else on Thursday, not to mention the weekend. And so I asked, why, why were you doing it like that? Why don't you take more rest and to sort of allow your voice to recover? But they were also singing roles, and they were only in their 30s. Roles that probably we shouldn't <laughs> sing until we're in our 40s, when you really know what you're doing. And I was very afraid of what could happen if I stayed in the opera house at that age, being offered the operas that people, I mean, for instance, I was offered, I keep talking about Kundry because it was absurd. Um, I was offered a production with a very, very famous product, production manager and a, a, an incredible director. Everybody knows his name. Everybody knows the name of the conductor. And they said, they'll be beautiful and we'll take care of you. And I said, no, I heard Leone Riznik sing that opera two nights ago, and that's not something I should be singing now. 
but I was simply listening to what was going on around me. And there, you know, without my parents or sort of a voice teacher or any of those things that can be of a support and help in those situations, I had to make those decisions myself. And I just found that I thought that it would be much better for me to go and mature a bit and then come back and sing some of these things. Yes, well, I was just very lucky. Yes. Hi. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, so working as a woman of color yes. uh, in the opera industry, yes. were there any issues or experiences that you had and what were they? How did you overcome these issues? Were there any what? Any issues? Oh, well, I'm sure that there were. Um, it will be pretentious to, to say otherwise. But uh, the lucky part of that, to give a bit of levity to a very serious question, is that I didn't actually um, have contact with people that were asking me to sing. This was done through my agent. So if there was something that I was asked to, to sing or told that I couldn't sing, then I simply didn't know about it, which was just fine with me. But I'm certain that there were occasions when I might have wanted or thought about doing something, and I wasn't asked to do it because of being African American. But um, I think if you would have a look at the work that I did do, it's hard to say that there were issues having to do with race, having to do with the incredible life I've been able to, to live and to experience. Because I think that would be disingenuous on my part and would not be realistic as to what has happened to me and with me and for me and on my behalf. Thank you. Yes, there's someone up there. Uh, I'm a young singer, and I was wondering, I was wondering if there's Use your diaphragm. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that we all understood how the voice actually works. I wish we all understood where the diaphragm is in the body, where the xiphoid process is in the body. How does this support your lungs? How does the air actually come out of your trachea? Where are your vocal cords? How do they vibrate? How does that actually work? I think if we understood our insides, if we understood our physicality more, we would be less anxious when we have a cold. We would be less anxious when we are tired because we would understand this is how the voice works. It might not be the singing I would do if I was sort of in full force and full health, but I understand how the voice is produced, how my voice is produced. So even on those days which are not so good, you still know what is going on and you're less anxious about it. That is the one thing I wish that we studied more in um, classes with, with young students. If we studied the pedagogy of singing, so that we understood how it's supposed to work. <laughs> Thank you for that question. It's very important. Hello. Um, uh, the title diva often has a negative connotation. Yes. But uh, recently, it's being reclaimed uh -huh. um, and often defined as uh, an empowering uh, feminine voice in yes. the public sphere. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to hear your relationship to this title, this this category of person, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, the the new kind of zeitgeist of it being reclaimed with a positive connotation. I think it's kind of funny uh, to find that you know people that are uh, sort of pop divas and all the rest of it, and the word has been appropriated for meaning, as you said, a person powerful in their profession. And I don't think that that's a bad thing, as long as we understand that uh, the word didn't the negative connotation was incorrect, and perhaps the connotation that we're using today is also incorrect. And uh, for singers, when we were talking about, for me, when I'm talking about singers whom I admire, I'd much rather call them a prima donna <laughs> than to call them a diva. Because nowadays, of course, you can wear an incredibly crazy costume and dance around and not really sing very well with the microphone in your throat, and you're a diva. 
No. Which isn't quite right, is it? <laughs> well, it's true. Never. It's not quite right. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, while well, you explained how you came to be singing the German repertoire so early in your career, prior to that fateful trip to Washington, what was that what you were hoping to do, or what did you envision yourself singing? I was simply singing music that appealed to me, no, truly. I was singing things that my voice teacher would recommend. I would sing things that I had listened to on the, the, on the, the Met Opera or recording, because I spent a lot of time in the listening library of the schools that I attended just sort of listening to other singers. And, um, and just lots and lots and lots of recordings. And I would say, well, I, I would like to sing this song, or what about this? And I heard a performance a long time ago. Gosh, when was that? I guess I was a student at Howard. And someone was singing The Prayer from Elizabeth and Tornhäuser. And I thought, it, I just thought it was beautiful. So I learned it and, and sang it. So I wasn't thinking at the time, this is what I want to do. And I think one of the things that has saved me in my professional life is that I never spent a minute in college or conservatory sort of lying in bed thinking, oh, one day I really want to do this. I want to sing this place. I want to, to do that. I want to do that. I simply wanted to get through school. I was on scholarship with full tuition. I want to do well and sort of maintain sort of my ability to sort of to continue in school. I didn't have, I didn't have at age, say, 18 in university, I did have a projection of myself years ahead and what I had to accomplish as a singer and where I had to sing by this time or I wasn't actually having a career. I just didn't have those plans. I didn't have that foresight. I was simply studying and getting along and understanding that I, there was so much more to learn, and there still is, um, that I wanted to learn it all. I mean, if you've got 460 songs of Schubert, you could be busy for a very long time. <laughs> Forever. Forever, yes, yeah. exactly. The lady in the front raised her hand earlier. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Me, um, yeah, hi. Uh, we've often heard of uh, sort of comical mishaps that take place on an operatic stage. Do you have any story uh, that you could tell us of something along well, those lines? Well, I, I don't actually sing those operas, you know, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> but I did have one funny experience singing uh, Figaro. Um, it was kind of a, a modern stage, and I was opening a door. I was meant to go through a door that really was not a door. I mean, there wasn't a building around it. but. It was meant to be, I was meant to be opening a door so that Susanna could come in to see me. And someone had left the key. The key wasn't in the door. And so Susanna had to walk around the door. <laughs> and that's not supposed to be the funny part of Nelson de Figaro. But that is what, that, I think that might be my only funny scene. <laughs> No, I don't get to go to the opera night. I listen to a great deal of orchestral music. I listen to a lot of piano music. And I listen to, to things that I sang where, when I sang in the choir at Howard University. I listened to Carmen Barana because I was in the choir when we did this. Or just the other day, I sat, I, I sing this now, but at the time I was in the choir for the St. Matthew Passion. And I had a million other things to do, and I thought to myself, I haven't listened to the St. Matthew in a very long time. And I sat down and listened to the entire thing, which meant that I was up very late at night doing the work I should have been doing during the day. But um, I listen to all kinds of different things, but I think mostly right now orchestral music and a lot of piano music and a lot of jazz. Yeah, we had a question up there. So, hi. Continue on your note on how um, um, singers in training, they are usually very busy with their current works and um, don't have, they don't expect or they don't actually, um, uh, let's say they don't really have a big plan yet. And in that circumstance, I think um, it's really easy to, to get distracted as 
for most of the time by the practicality of the career and sometimes they get really confused of what their next step should be mm -hmm. and where to go especially um in their like late undergrads or early master degree and mm -hmm. then um it's uh it's it can be really confusing and hard on this uh, yes. on the on the uh, apprentice i would say um what are some of the advice that you want to give them or you can you 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 think it's best for them to listen to hmm that is a very interesting question just give me a moment to think about that yeah sure <laughs> i feel that it is wiser if you're in graduate school or in conservatory and you were thinking, trying to work out what you should do next, what you should do next is to learn another good piece of music <laughs> and to have that as, as part of your life and as part of your repertoire. I mean, I'm not the first person to say that preparation is the first part of success. And I think that if you have a list of 50 songs, or maybe less, that you know really, really well, that you have two or three operas that you feel are suitable for your voice at age 22, 23, which of course are Mozart and Handel, aren't they? And that you really feel that you know these parts very well, the opportunity will arise. Preparation and opportunity will give you success. And I think that that is more important than worrying about what you should do next. Because there's so many different opportunities now. I mean, imagine that you could actually apply for um, uh, being accepted at a university by singing, sending a DVD. You used to have to show up and sing. <laughs> But um, I d would hope you would simply decide to continue working and not to be discouraged, but to simply know that there are certain things that you can sing as well as you can sing them. And that you're not sort of trying to do the repertoire that you think is most popular, but the repertoire that is most suitable to your instrument as you stand in your 20s. I think that that is the thing to do. I really do feel that. I worry about so many of, of my younger colleagues that are, are wanting to, to sing. I had, for instance, I worked with one young woman about four years ago who was in her 20s and singing Traviata. And I said, my darling, there are so many other things you should be, you should be singing. You shouldn't be singing one of Verdi's most difficult operas, not at this stage and not in an opera house in Germany that's you know, like Wuppertal or something where you've got 700 seats and you'll be okay. But singing in an auditorium in the Midwest someplace that is not necessarily an opera house, is not an opera house at all, where the orchestra is certainly going to drown you out and where you're going to strain throughout all, all of the rehearsals just to be heard. So I, I worry about those decisions to sort of do something because if I, if I sing in front of that person, that person is going to give me another job. Go into the studio and learn the repertoire and be prepared for whatever happens. And if you're prepared, I promise you it will happen. And don't be tempted to sing La Traviata when you're 27 years old. I know we could be here forever. But <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid we only have time for one more question up there. Oops. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Howard University. Yes. Excuse me? Oh, uh, yes, of course. Yes. Talk about what it was like for you at that stage in your life? Well, as I, as I said, I didn't have voice lessons until I became a student at Howard University. And uh, the way that this happened is that I was just about to be 16 years old, just about old enough to, be, to enter the Marian Anderson competition in Philadelphia. I was just about to be 16. I didn't know that the competition included people singing, uh, singers from the age 16 to 30. <clears throat> so I arrived and sang for the Marian Anderson competition. I didn't win anything, but I was very encouraged by the people that had been on the jury. And I was living, of course, in Georgia at the time, and I had relatives in Philadelphia, and I also had relatives in Washington. So I was traveling with my coach, well, my um, choir director from school, and so we stopped in Washington on the way back to Augusta, it was the weekend, so we didn't have to be in a hurry. 
and she had been a student of one of the deans at Howard University. And uh, so Rosa Sanders, who was my person who was accompanying me at the time, called the university to say, is there someone, you know, I could go and sort of sing for somebody there. We weren't looking for anything. We just, since we were there, why not sing the repertoire that I'd sung in Philadelphia? Why not do that? And so we were invited to go to sing at a pedagogy class at Howard University, a master's degree class for the voice. And um, we just showed up. Of course, I didn't understand in those days that one needed, one needed to warm up the voice. Who knew about those things? And so I could sing you know, at 8 o'clock in the morning as easily as I could sing at 8 o'clock at night. And so we went along and were you know, sort of stationed outside of the class and was beckoned in by the professor at some point. And there was a piano in the classroom, and I sang my songs. And um, she said to me, wait after the class, I want to talk to you. And she said, how old are you? I said, I'm 16, I'm gonna be 16 in a week. And so she said, um, are you doing well in high school? I said, oh yes, I'm on the dean's list. <laughs> so full of myself. And uh, so she said, um, when you're old enough, I want you to come to Howard University and I'm going to teach you. That's how that all happened. And um, she talked the dean into giving me a scholarship. That's how I went to Howard University. And I worked, as I said, with Carolyn Grant, who by the time I was there, had been teaching voice for 45 years. And she knew what she was talking about. Clearly. <laughs> Clearly. Well, um, I think we're all a little bit sad that we have to um, stop here. But I want to thank you so very much for talking to us. Well, thank you so much. To us. It was an absolute thrill for me. Thank you. Um, and I know for you, too. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> You're a great audience member. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Great pleasure.